Green Fossil. And first off, I'd like to thank Herdy for scheduling this talk for us today. And also Lazada. And also Lazada for the venue. Uh, so today we'll be talking about SQL View, which is our persistent library, and what we learned from developing it. So we'll be talking more about our experience rather than the library itself. And if you have any question during the session, you can leave it for the Q&A session at the end. Thank you. So uh, I myself, I'm Jake, and this is Kate. We're both software engineer in Green Fossil, and we do full stack development. And as you can see, these are our technologies currently in our stack. <clears throat> oh, oh, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So for today, we start off with our background, and then we tell you what SQL View is, and also why did we build a persistent library, followed by some examples and demo, and also what's installed for us in the future. <clears throat> so starting off with our background, we started in 2005, and most of our and all of our projects are mainly in Java with Hibernate. And we found that as the year goes by, we wanted to be more productive. And also, we want to look for new technologies that can help us build better system. So in 2012, we were looking at Scala. And when we were transiting to Scala, we, <coughs> we were faced with uh, limited options of a uh, persistent library in Scala. So we decided to build our own persistent library. And then a year later, we managed to release the first version. And finally, to this year, 2019, we updated it so that it can now support Scala 213. <clears throat> so this is our persistent library, which it sits on top on Scala like JDBC. And the main goal in mind to provide flexibility for developers to create their own data view without having the need of annotations and also reduce boilerplating. So when we moved to Scala, we were in need of a persistent library and with a certain features that can meet our requirements. So we're going to tell you why we built it. So first, we need Scala and Java to coexist together. So we have to keep in mind that we already have Java projects that are live in production. And we do not want to take them down so that we need the new Scala versions of it to coexist with one another using the same database. So a quick overview. So over here, we have one Java application and Java Scala application. So we need them both to be using the same database, updating and reading from the same database. Yep. So another reason why was that we want to move away from annotations and to reduce boilerplating. And we want to give our developers a lesser effort to create database schema and also to focus more on the SQL language itself. So in this uh, example screenshot, on the left side, we have a snippet from a table from our old Java projects. As you can see here, you have to learn all the JPN annotations to be able to define a table. If you move your attention to the, to the left, here we have uh, our table defined in Scala. So how do we write a table in Scala using our library? First, you define an object, say user table, and then you define the table name here as user, and then followed by the columns and this column type, and then by the table constraints. So we're telling the library that we want the column value ID to be our primary key for this table. And similarly for the next table, user email, we define the table name followed by its column and its column type and also the con table constraints. So here we have foreign key, we're telling the library that we want the user ID value column to point to the user table's ID column value. So as you can see, this is very natural and SQL-like, so it's easier for me to my opinion to write this compared to the left side. So next in our mind, we want to have flexibility in our queries to be able to create complex reports and pull data from different tables without having to bring every column into the memory. Thus, we made our library to be like SQL, which allows developers to create their queries with any kind of projections that they need. So here are some examples on how we can build queries using the library. But first, let me show you the schema that we're going to use for the following examples. 
So we have a user table that has a one-to-many relationship to this address table. So, okay. so here we have two select statements. So let's say we need to generate a report that requires first a user ID, a user first name, the user's last name, and a user's city. So all you need is to put that four columns into your projection. So you start with a select, and then your projection, the ID, first name, last name, and also pointing to the address city. Then you say which table you're querying from, the user table, which is the user object, object. And then you join to the address table. And then finally, you use the list method to tell the library what is the data type that will be returned from the result set. So in this case, it will be a list of tuple, a long, which is the ID, a string, which is the first name, another string, which is the last name, and the last string, which is the city. But this is assuming that you need it to be binded into the tuple. But if you don't want, you can bind it into a case class as well. So here we have a case class defined user address with few ID, first name, last name, and CD. So all you have to do is the projection has to match uh, positionally with the case class, and the library will buy, be able to bind your result set into the case class user address. So next, in this example, if you require more if you require more manipulation of your result set, you can use you can use the list using method which will bring you the result set, and you can tell it based on what projection you want to bind the data to, which is projection one. I'm saying that I want to bind it to a type of long. And projection two, I want to bind it to a type of string. And if you don't want to use the index, projection index, you can use the column name itself, and your, which is to ref reference to the user ID. And I say I want to bind it to a long. So in this example, we have another select statement which is similar to what I showed you in the previous slide. But here we omitted out the join clause. So what the library is capable of helping you with is because it knows that you're in your projection, you're pointing to the address table, but you only specify that you're pulling from the user table. What it can do is you'll be able to generate the join clause for you in the final statement. So we're going to show you a little code example on how this works. Okay, you can see here. Is it, uh, can you guys see? It's okay. So you can see here we have query, which is our select statement. And we have three projections, user ID, user first name, and then to another table, address city. But we only have, we didn't specify the join clause. So if we were to print the statement out, so we're going to run this test case. Sorry. So give us a minute. <clears throat> so you can see here the generator statement is this is just a SQL statement. So a select, your projection, and if you notice here, it was able to provide you the join clause. So this itself is very helpful for a develop, developer because whatever select statement you stated here in query, value query, when it's generated, you can directly pull this out into your SQL workbench and test out the query itself if it's not working for you. Okay. 
So what I've shown you was pulling lists of results from your result set, but also we have other convenience methods that we use. For example, first and first using, which will only bring out the first result from your result set, and single and single using, which only returns one result from your result set and also expects that your result set has only one, a size of one. If it's more than a size of one, an exception will be thrown. Yeah. So I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague here. Okay, continuing on the why do we need to build our own um, persistent layer. So um, one of those reasons is we want our queries to be refactor friendly. So um, if we, one of our target when we're creating this is we want our queries to be, our functions to be feel and look like SQL. At the same time, we want it to be maintainable and easy to refactor. So that's why with this in mind, we want our um, all our functions for CRUD, which is um, create, read, update, and delete, will be um, maintainable and easy to refactor. Okay, so one of the examples. Okay, so um, here are some examples on how we insert a record into the database. So first thing is the insert and return generated key. So this um, this is useful when we have like a table that's a, that has a primary key and also enabled a auto increment. So every time we insert a record into the database table, it will generate a key. Automate the SQL will, create, will generate a key. So this um, this function will will insert those values and return you the generated key. And then if you want to um, insert more than one um, records at the same time, we have the insert batch uh, function that can, have, that can do that. So for example, you have like 100 records that you want to insert uh, in one go, then this might not be the most optimized um, way to do, to do it because it will hit the database multiple times. So we, that's why we created the insert batch that it will just um, insert the entire uh, 100 records in one query. Okay, so um, if you notice in this example, we have um, references in the column variable except of the, of, the tab of the table. So whatever changes that we are doing in the schema, like for example, we have enhancement in our um, in our schema and then we need to rename or delete a column. Um, when we do changes in our code in that schema, um, in our code in our, in our schema object, we, it will reflect in, in, all, in our code that references it. Also, when we want to update a, a record, you just need to um, use the object table uh, table object and then call the update function and then pass on the columns that we want to update and the values that we want to update to and then the where clause which is um, to determine which are the rules that we want to update. Okay. Lastly, one of the criteria that we want to have in a persistent library is it should be type safe. We, when we move to Scala, one of the features that we really like about Scala is the type safetyness, and we want to leverage on this feature to make our library and better and help the developer um, have more traceability when developing um, our features in our codes. One feature that we want is the ability to detect type mismatch to insert and update. Okay, if you notice here, we have the update um, uh, functions that calls a, the, the, col the column variables and then pass the, the values, which is Hoey and Simpson. But if you can see, the first name, last name, and gender are actually in, are, are using a, 
are in type string, which is, means that it is expecting a tuple of string, uh, string, string, string. However, in the values, we have a um, Hoey Simpson and one, which is an integer. So it will able to help us determine that in this part of our code, it, it, we are expecting a string, and then um, the developer is passing a integer. So one of the, another feature is the ability to detect type mismatch to select queries. When we're creating um, complex reports, there will be cases that the developer will be able to will not be able to to see the, there's mismatch on the type of of projections and the the type of, of the return type that we are expecting. So we added this feature that will help us that when we execute this um, this query, it will be able to tell us that which part of the query that we are executing ha failed to bind. So for example, we have this very simple query, which is I'm selecting a user ID and a first name. So what I'm it's what the the result set supposed to be is it's a long, a top of long and a string. But in the in the list we are expecting a return type which of a top of long and int. So when this query is executed, there will be an error thrown and then the developer will be will be informed that in the second column, which is the first name, it failed to bind because expecting an int, and then it returned a value, it was trying to bind to a value user one, which is a string. So this helped us to, to trace our code better and also to debug which part of the code that we need to change. Okay, so that's all. Um, okay, so we have talked about our background, what we, what is SQL view and what we have, um, why we did, why we built um, SQL view and how we built it. And um, when we were developing it, we are, when we are developing it, we are able to ap appreciate Scala even more because it allowed us to, to create better libraries. We are able to improve on the traceability in our code because of, um, we are able, we have the control on how to, to create SQL queries in our own way. And um, it, it increased our productivity because it just need us to focus on what we need to do and also just for us to, to focus on learning SQL instead of the actual library. Okay, so what's next for us is um, we are targeting to, to move into Scala tree and um, we are planning to, we are starting to develop um, a replacement for Scala JDBC, and um, we would like to improve our performance even more. Okay, so um, any questions? Yes. So I sort of have two questions. First, uh, how do you specify parameters to the query, to select query, uh, where clause? So you mean the select query? Okay. Can you show in the... And specifically, like what if your uh, parameters are calculated? It's not just a static string. Okay. So the first question is how do we do a where clause and then what if the parameters is calculated? Yeah. So. Um, but when you say calculator, will it, does it mean in the SQL uh, side or in the Scala side? Yeah, on Scala side. Let's say it's a ID of entity that comes all the way from the from the user. Okay. So I say uh, ad user address. Mm. Okay. So to to do the where clause is just. Have to, so okay. It's when we're creating let's a select. Let's say above results, you see you have while ID equals one. 
while ID. So you, you're saying that as a variable you want to yeah, pass yeah. in, right? Mm -hmm. So you use string interpolation to pass it in. Yeah, yeah, I see. So okay. now, uh, so am I, yeah. yeah, right. Am I the only one seeing simple injection here? Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so you're talking but about... Let me rephrase this. Are there any built-in protection in the library that prevents SQL injection like this? Yes. Okay, so for this select queries, this is converted into a prepared statement, which uh, will um, avoid SQL injection. We have tested it as well in our project. Okay. The other yeah. one is, you mentioned that you wanted like, basically everything to be refactor friendly. Yes. I, but I guess you're, like, when you're creating this relationship or table or whatever it is, you have some mechanism to create it in the database. Yes. So what if you add a new column? So how do you handle migrations? Okay. My migration? So for adding of columns currently, um, we are doing it manually. So there's no, um, it, we don't support updating of columns like um, other um, persistent layer does. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I, I like the, the type safety that you of course. This is pretty powerful. But, uh, why did you choose to automatically insert joins in queries that lack them instead of actually you know, not compile? Uh, I think that would be, like, personally, I would favor uh, validity of the queries and uh, readability. Making it explicit rather than here, it's, it's an inner join, right? Like yes. You know, left join and right join. So you, you make a choice. Uh, why? Okay, so the auto join is just like one feature. It depends on the developer how they want to query their own select queries. So if they want to be fancy, then they can do all the left joins, inner joins that they want. But if it's just a very um, simple query, like you just have two tables that you want to join, then you can use this, but you have a choice to use it or not to use it. Yeah. And it's just join or is it there are other automatically injected? Um, currently, we only have join, which is um, the inner join. Any questions? Yes. Uh, does this depend on Scala and JDBC? Yes. Uh, my second question is, uh, do you support transactions? For example, uh, in library like Slink, you can mess two queries with uh, for loop, and then the one field, the other one is go back. Okay, currently we don't do that. Yeah. So we are, um, what we do is that we have a connection and then we, we just do uh, all the queries there. And then um, if it has, it, it failed, then we, it will throw an exception, which is we usually um, wrap it into a, tr a try, which will, you can do whatever recovery you want when, you, when, it, when, the, th when the error is thrown. Okay, any question? Is it open source? Okay, what? So, no, it's currently it's not open source. But we have plans to make it open source. Just that right now, uh, there are challenges that we foresee that uh, make us choose the decision not to open source it. Yeah. So like maintenance. Yeah, it's yeah, just Google for SQL. There's a company named SQL View that's doing electronic <laughs> in Singapore. Oh. So oh. this name is taken. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Any more? Yeah. Uh, usually, like, uh, there are different like, people who handle the database for the DBA, right? So when you hit the like, performance, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 When you hit the performance issue, Sometimes you are not the only only one who tried to do the optimization. There are some other people who only uh, familiar with the SQL. Then my question is: Is there any tools, internet tools, that can convert from pure SQL query back to the the, the your SQL? So currently, what we do is that when we um, create our SQL um, SQL scripts, right. select scripts. We would just do it in um, like any other tools like Workbench, and then when we do that, we will just translate it manually into a SQL view. Yes.
Okay. Any other question? Okay. Um, next yeah. slide. Okay, so as we said, we are from Green Fossil and then we are currently hiring. So if you are interested to join us, uh, contact us through this. Thank you. Thank you.